Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Board of Supervisors' regular meeting in beautiful King William County. I believe you would be called Mr. Wiskowski? Here. Mr. Greenwood? Here. Mr. Hanson? Here. Mr. Earhart? Here. Mr. Hawkins? Here. Uh, and folks, would you rise with me for a moment of silence to follow the immediate advice of the Pledge of Allegiance to the Fire Department?
There are a few people there, maybe about 26, and then we had firemen also in attendance. But um, in the course of the meeting, there were people that asked questions, one of them being a couple who had no children, but wanted the information on the school board and their funding. And uh, his uh, question was not answered, so I suggested that maybe he might want to go on the school board site and check out the budget. And um, then a couple of days later, um, well, the, the next day, I guess, there's an email that came out that a citizen erroneously replied to a certain person that the school budget uh, information was available on the website. However, he says neither was allocated, allocation or requested uh, FY 1920 is posted. However, on the school board website, in two places, they had school um, proposed budget FY 1920, that's one place, and on the other place, there was another budget PDF file FY 1920. So, so um, I went online and I pulled up a 21 page budget that was there. And I believe you all got that when you met with the school board. Didn't you all get a copy of that? Well, the answers are there. And the man said he just wanted to make a comment because uh, you know, he wanted to see the school budget. But he had no children. So I look at it this way. The modus operandi is not changing. We have uh, people that agitate, present, present chaos, and then they stick their thumb in your eye and say, you know, down with you. And it's not appreciated that you'd be called out for something that wasn't an error. So I wanted to let you know, not, and I doubt, did not get any, uh, any type of a sorry or anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Road. There's another 
area where we've got a deep ditch. Um, that is extremely dangerous because the, when you go off the edge of the pavement, you're in the ditch in both locations. And um, uh, issue on Herring Creek Road, Route 604, we continue to have problems on that um, with potholes, the edges of pavement washed out in several locations, and logs in the ditch that are uh, stopping the uh, drainage. So I'm just hoping Ms. McGowan can take care of that. Thank you. Do you have a street address or anything for that, Mr. Chairman? The last for Heron Creek Road, do we have any kind of uh, identification? I mean, 7,000 Heron Creek Road, 2,000 oh. Heron Creek Road, Heron Creek Road. Heron Creek Road from Route 30 to Route 60. So the whole length. Dealing with resolution 1920, we can discuss. Uh, I just I felt as though there was some revision needed to the minutes uh, from the last board meeting. So that's that's uh, that's where I was looking to possibly pull those last, which would be the March 25th board meeting, pending revisions. So is that then, Mr. Chairman, motion? Motion to okay. approve the consent and the absent the March 25th 
meeting the okay, I'll second. Any further discussion? Any other My name is Maisie Mitchell. I live in Aylet, a small town in King William County. I think King William is a great place, but it could be better with a leader like me. There are many things I would change in King William County if I were on the Board of Supervisors. My changes would include fixing the roads to make them safer, opening emergency care facilities that are open 24 hours a day every day, and build an auditorium for the schools in our county and the community. Out of all the changes I would make in King William County, the most important to me is to open emergency care facilities in King Moy. We have no doctor's offices that are open 24 hours a day or open on the weekends. It takes 30 or more minutes to get to the nearest urgent care center. In a critical situation, a person may need to be seen right away and can't wait 30 minutes. It could be a life or death situation and some people who do not have insurance will not call an ambulance. If we had urgent care centers in King William, people could get quicker treatment, which could save their life. Another thing I would fix in King Juan County are the roads to make them safer for cars and especially school buses. One of the biggest problems on the road are all the potholes, so I would pave them. Also, I would make the roads wider to accommodate both ways of traffic. Sometimes it is not safe for buses to travel on the same road at the same time because the road is too narrow. Another problem we currently have is branches and trees that are not trimmed back and hit tractors, big trucks, and buses. I would work with the county and VDOT workers to make sure our roads are always kept safe. If I were on the Board of Supervisors, I'd want to build an auditorium for the schools and the community. If King William County had an auditorium, our schools could hold concerts and performances in there instead of performing in the gym or cafeterias in the schools. The community can also hold whatever they like, fundraising, family events, and our annual fine arts festival can be held in the auditorium. Plus, an auditorium would be a great place for local people to show off their talents. In conclusion, if I was on the Board of Supervisors, I would fix the roads to make them safer, open emergency care facilities that are open 24 hours a day, every day, and build an auditorium that the schools and community can use. Just these three changes can make a big difference in my community.
school.
tough battle there with the Absolutely. Bay. And so far, it's where I, I agree. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's not just any county, it's everywhere. It's not just trash trucks. And folks, you're going to have to deal with me. I just lost the screw out of my eyeglasses. I don't know where it went to. I will try to make it really <laughs> Everything is running on all cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> but it only can get better. All right, 9A, Resolution 19-20, authorizing the county to utilize the Firefox County procurement with AT&T as part of the next generation 911 agreement. Bobby Gentlemen, what you have in front of you is a narrow resolution. Um, as you remember, back in November of 2018, Steve Marzoff with VEDA uh, came and did the presentation for the migration proposal for the next generation 911 project. Uh, in February, I brought to the board a request to go ahead and utilize the Fairfax County procurement with AT&T uh, that had been part of the original uh, testing that was done. And the board requested that I wait until um, the end of April to bring this back to y'all again because the city of Virginia Beach had been planning on putting out an RFP uh, to see if they could find a competitive uh, price to uh, go against the AT&T contract. Um, as of January 4th, the city of Virginia Beach did put out the proposal. Uh, they're par uh, currently in the process of shortlisting the vendors and plan on scheduling interviews in early May and probably uh, finishing those interviews and going into negotiation in June or July timeframe. Uh, but that is all the information that I could collect on this. Now, one thing to remember is that this migration proposal, the full deployment is expected to be completed no later, uh, later than December 2021. King William County is part of the Stuart Chester Selective Router and our scheduled deployment is January 2020 to June 2020. So we are about um, oh, just a few months out from it. And the reason that I'm bringing this to you is because there is a lot of activity that has to occur before um, we go into our migration, which would be in uh, January. Uh, what happens is that uh, once the board approves utilizing the AT&T contract. Um, I will submit the PAL, which is the performance agreement. That will go to the uh, 911 services board, and they meet every two months. So our deadline for getting these to the um, service board is May 28th for them to hear it the 11th of July. And um, three months prior to the migration, which would be October, we have to have all of our cleanup completed. And uh, there is still a great deal to be done. Uh, VEDA is offering assistance with the GIS data cleanup um, because we just have one uh, GIS technician. She's doing an excellent job, uh, but it is a great deal of work. So the reason that I'm bringing this to you is that yes, the city of Virginia Beach has um, issued their RFP and they are in negotiations, um, but we're kind of looking at a time crunch, and I would like to go ahead and request that we utilize the at and contract and uh, allow us to move forward with this. Mr. Chairman, if I might, this was one of my questions. Is there some type of comparison between the Virginia Beach contract and the Fairfax available for yes, us to decide which? Yes, sir. There's no pros or cons for either one. They literally just started shortlisting the vendors of Virginia Beach. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. So, I just so sure. yeah, there's no, um, you know, as far as with the RFP, <clears throat> I mean, the RFP is pretty straightforward. Here, here's the thing with it. You know, obviously, uh, Vita is uh, basically offering to pick up the entire tab of construction and implementation. I think the big difference <coughs> is where where some localities were wanted to see what else might be out there, if there is in fact anything else out there, was in those recurring costs, which VITA is picking up for um, you know, a certain period, but then um, we start paying um, a higher monthly fee than we are currently. So the concern is, is not from, again, construction and implementation. There's no cost to us on that. That's where, you know, that's the, the telephone taxes and all that stuff. 
that's what BETA is putting towards um, towards this, this bill, this project. Um, the, the only concern, again, is those recurring fees. I'm not sure that there is anything else out there. Uh, I don't know who responded. I don't know who they're going through as, as far as qualifiers or anything at this point in time. I did reach out to um, PDC folks to see if there had been any any movement anywhere on any other you know fronts that they might have any inside information that could help. And are any, are any of the other localities moving forward? I mean, what what why do we have to be in, in the forefront on this? And We're not in the forefront. Um, I spoke with Steve Morsoff on April 22nd, and I included some information in the memo. Uh, Ten localities have approved proposal acceptance letters. Uh, from the 911 Service Board, and six of those have executed contracts with AT&T. Uh, eight localities have submitted the PALS, and one has executed the contract with AT&T. Uh, there are 13 localities that have not acted, and that's one of us, that's us. These 10 um, localities in our geographic area are across the mm, They are in the um, Stewart Chester Select Route, which is the only thing that we mm -hmm. concern ourselves right. with. Right. Um, I mean, the thing that you need to keep in mind is that I guess why I am supportive of using the AT&T model is for the simple fact that VEDA was heavily involved throughout the entire process, which was almost a 24-month period, um, negotiating, being right there along with um, Fairfax. And so I have a lot of faith in that negotiated contract. And yes, Mr. Moskowski is correct. There is going to be an increase after, after uh, two years. Uh, to our uh, reoccurring costs, but even the 911 Service Board, and I believe I sent y'all an email on this, has stated that there has been a great deal of concern voiced about that increase and the impact that it's going to have on localities, and they have actually formed a committee uh, to look into it to see if there's anything in addition that they could do to soften the blow. So, yes, we can wait for the city of um, Virginia Beach, but VEDA is not really participating with that uh, review and negotiation, from what I understand. And they're going to be under a time crunch, whereas Fairfax took their time and did it right. So, you know, we can wait, or we can go ahead and move on this. Fairfax is one of the major negotiators in the state, but I mean, it's not a whole lot that they haven't touched on. With. And I just don't see the value of waiting for myself. This is standing the possibility of getting behind. And this is a mandatory uh, install for us. It's taking it to some type of, uh, I don't know that the T1 line is the proper word anymore, but it's bringing in the 911 service with two, two lines on some type of digital. On that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's going to help a lot of things. Um, you know, we talked about GIS cleanup. Um, that's going to be one major component of it because that's going to be, um, they, they want that working better for the, for the type of uh, computer-aided dispatch system that's going to be utilized in it. Um, it's going to make transfer 911 calls across jurisdictions uh, easier. And, it, it uh, you know, one of the concepts is that it will also be able to scrutinize cellular data more accurately and get 911 calls from cell phones to the right place um, more efficiently. And then even when they are uh, sent to the wrong place, they can get it to the right place quickly without having to hang up and make new phone calls, things of that nature. And again, um, you know, the primary concern here is that recurring cost, you know, that should be pretty clear by now. The install cost is 100% is on Vita. We're not picking up any of that tab. Um, Came from the 911 I can't remember the exact funding source, but it was one of those. So telecommunication, telecommunication. Yeah, one of those, one of those things that shows up on the phone. Um, and sure, the issue with uh, having to transfer 911 is, is it somewhat often? We, we routinely transfer 911 calls to other jurisdictions, yes, because of problems. So if you're going to make a motion on accepting the resolution, I would draw your attention to my comment pertaining to line 25. I think there's a typo there. 
I think it should say whereas Fairfax County in coordination or with not it doesn't need to say with and in. Oh, that's an easy one. Yeah. I think it's just the word with is is it there done it? I think it just need to say in coordination. Strike with. Strike with. With that correction, I'll make a motion. And we accept 19 20. Second. I think we just made a 1920R, didn't we? Yes, yes we yeah. did. You're correct. Thank you. For discussion, Mr. Earhart? Aye. Mr. Muskelsky? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hanson? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. The next item we have is 9B. Yeah, um, 9B is Ordinance 02 19. R approving the rezoning application that came up for the last regular meeting. C-01-19. The owner is Kellen Holmes um, and Mr. Heather, Director of Community Development. I think Mr. Kellen is here. Yes, he is. Good evening. At the last meeting, the board asked for a little clarification. I sent y'all a memo. It should be in your packets. The, uh, it gives all the basic information about the application. The application is by Kelvin Holmes. He would like to rezone the property from R1 to B2, so residential to general business. Uh, you pull my thing up there? The same as in your packet. This provides the location. The highlighted parcel on the map is the location for the rezoning. I uh, just wanted to give you all a feel for where it was. And the reason for the rezoning is he would like to make the property more marketable for commercial development. There's only about, I'm going to pull up another map for you. sections are already zone B1. The red section across 360 is a B2 zone, which would be what this uh, request is for this parcel here. And staff evaluated to make sure that the application was complete and that it uh, fit in with comprehensive plan for the county. I know during the planning commission meeting and also during the public hearing of the last board of supervisors meeting, there were some concerns about traffic and the access on and off of 360. Um, the property as it stands right now would go to, uh, y'all approve the application, would become B2, which allows for commercial businesses. Any development along 360 is going to have VDOT issues. It's going to, have to be something that we have to be concerned with. Uh, those issues are addressed uh, at the time of site planning. So anything in this corridor that would be used on this property would have to go site review by not only us, but also by VDOT. So site plans are required for any development. At this point right now, we're just seeing about moving this property from residential to business. It meets the comprehensive plan. The planning commission voted four to one at their meeting to approve the rezoning application. And uh, staff also recommends that the board uh, take the planning commission recommendation. 
Uh, Mr. Kellum is here. I can answer any questions, but I'm sure he would like the opportunity to speak to you as well. You state you have anything to add. I just wanted Mr. Kellum to be here because I said I already pushed it at our meeting that y'all wanted more clarification. I had one break the news that Mr. Kellum said I don't know how much he wanted to uh, divulge, but if he wants to say, I think the board would like to hear if you're willing to say that because that's what their hold up was. They wanted to know maybe a proposed, and I know you said it was iffy and you were trying to get it first, but if you could maybe explain a little bit, I think that might help. <laughs> that's all I have. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Daryl Kellum, 10284 West River Road, Mr. Greenwood's District, 3rd District. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to apologize for not being at the last meeting. I did make the mistake of thinking the Planning Commission would, the next month would be the board meeting, not in the same month, so meant no disrespect to anyone here. Um, I have prepared a, a couple packages, if I may hand them out. Packages there basically just show what Mr. Adder has already shown here that adjacent to and across the street from is already zoned B. Um, and some of the residential property on either side of it has signs on it for sale or uh, commercial potential there. So I think we would all agree the, the 360 corridor, as I heard someone say earlier, from river to river pretty much should have some commercial potential. Um, being in the county every day like I am working, conducting business as a builder and developer, I get calls on a weekly basis of businesses looking to come to King William County and we have nothing to offer them. And if someone has to identify a piece of property, negotiate, and then make it contingent upon rezoning, they typically look over us and keep moving on. Um, Hanover County, not that we always follow Hanover County, but basically they are zoned from river to river that any property can be B. They actually took it one step further. They will allow you to rezone your property B, B1, B2, whatever, and keep paying the current taxes until the property is sold and someone purchases it and puts it into that use, which I thought was pretty small on their behalf. Um, my main thing is I have businesses come every day looking for somewhere to go and we just don't have anywhere to book. So that's why I bought this piece of property up. The package you have there shows basically the, the B zoning around it, and it shows pictures of approximately four to five acres of usable ground fronting on 360, and the remaining 20 some acres is basically challenged by Ravine's RPA, which provides just a great buffer around the property. I hope that offer some clarification. So you also mentioned to us that what you might turn the back part into. Yes. That would help tell them. Plus, I wanted to mention the front part is where the county water line goes through, so they can't use any of that, all this part, to the left because that is right away to the county for the water line. Yeah, and one of those pictures shows the blue water line right. going basically through the middle of my property. I currently have, it's 165 acres there and three parcels. This one being the smaller of the three. The other two parcels that are contiguous to this and behind this, um, I've already committed to putting an easement on the property where they can never be developed. I've already replanted them uh, with pine seedlings, and that will provide even more of a buffer from the adjacent neighborhoods and anything that might be impacted by it other than other commercial properties along 360. Thank you. <clears throat> no, Mr. Chairman, I, I think um, Mr. Edder answered a lot of the questions in, in the updated information that he provided in the packet as far as concerns over, uh, you know, VDOT, um, site reviews and things of that nature to make sure that, um, you know, it, it fits in up there. We, of course, have the TCO up there uh, as well, for better or worse. Um, so, uh, no, and then, and then Mr. Collins answered the questions with regards to its abutment to the residential neighborhood as well and what's what's out there to be used. Actually, I got to, I, I took a look at it when I drove up to um, 
me and Mr. Earhart were dragging around this past uh, weekend and kind of saw what the, the topography back there. So. And, and I'd also like to add, one of the planning commission's concerns was the entrance going in there with the muddy entrance. I did get with VDOT. VDOT did allow me to put a pipe in and put gravel in. And the biggest reason for allowing me to do it, there's a fire hydrant on that water line that the fire department would like to be able to utilize it. In the past, you could not get in and out of there to utilize it. So I did put a pipe in and build a gravel road in so that they could utilize that fire hydrant. Mr. Chairman, um, it might have been that, that might have been that. What was the concern of one person that voted no, Mr. Pellin? What was, or, or Stephen, what was the reason that some did? It was, like you said, the road was not suitable or he thought that it needed to be upgraded to beat on standards, but like Mr. Kellum was stating, he didn't want to do it all that trouble if it wasn't going to get rezoned, put in a commercial entrance, um, things like that, so it is coming over the hill, but there would be enough room, and like I said, he, Mr. Kellum would have to follow all the VDOT rules if he did get that, and so I think the planning commission uh, was just wondering that they wouldn't be followed, but we're pretty good at our new um, building of, uh, administrator is Turning lane, turning lane would be required. That's what we don't know. That's what he wanted. The one, one of, I think to answer your question, I, I think Mr. Wagner's concern was the entrance there, mm -hmm. which I've corrected. As far as building a turning lane or any sort of entrance, that would only come with VDOT approval, and I would have to make application right. to let them know right. what type building in the daily flow before they would design an entrance. Okay. And at which point I would have to put that entrance in, depending on the number of vehicles coming and going each day. Okay. One last thing, and like I said, we are, uh, the citizens are concerned about lowering taxes, and that's what Mr. Kellum is trying to do. He's trying to make it available so that commercials can bring more business, which in turn would lower real estate taxes if this happens. But like I said, he has to go through all this. When a company comes, like we just did with Tractor Supply, they may not have waited like Tractor Supply. The Tractor Supply was very patient. They waited until all that stuff went through, and then we did pass that last month. But Mr. Kellum is trying to get all this stuff in. I said he does have some proposed uh, clients that he's looking at to maybe use to utilize that site. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 0219R. Second. No further. Olivia. Mr. Stocky? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hanson? Aye. Mr. Earhart? Aye. Mr. Hopkins? Aye. Thank you. The next item we have is a public hearing in consideration of Resolution 19-21 adopting King William County Secondary Highway Secure Improvements Plan. George McGowan, Community Department of Transportation Residence, the Administrator. And I don't know if you can, I don't know if you touch on anything to do with, I guess, that park and ride. If you can, can you just, we'll discuss it another time. Um, when the county applied for the smart scale project to um, improve the park and ride, um, I'd have to look at the application and find out what plans other people have seen. We're using the existing gravel lot and we're just repaving it and adding lighting. There were in no way, I think, expanding the footprint beyond where it is. So I need to, um, and I know that the citizen had contacted um, our project managers about where the property lines were and where the, you know, the Commonwealth property is versus the private property. And we do know that we need to make some sort of correction to make sure that cars only use the lot in the entrance off of Sharon Road. Um, and I think if we haven't or have done already, we did try to get um, the people that were parking their cars there for sale to stop doing that and have um, added signs for no commercial parking and things like that um, to take care of that. So I'm not sure that the park and ride is expanding to the point where it's going to encroach on any bigger piece of property than what's already being used. The purpose of the project that the county applied for was to provide an asphalt surface and lighting and things like in that. In the existing park. In the existing I, area. I have a photo in it. You can tell they're using this drive where to go yeah, across yeah, it. Yeah. So Is there can, any way maybe you can come up with yeah. something to prohibit that? Yeah, we can put some, put some 
smaller stuff or something on that side. But yeah, I don't think there's any intent to expand the park and ride because the size currently as it is seems to be beneficial and um, appropriate for the number of using it. We're combining this project with um, a project that Essex County applied for for Smart Scale to improve their park and ride as well. So we're using the same um, model is to just take what we have and, and hard surface it, add the parking spots and lighting and things like that to make it more attractive and, and usable for the folks. So. And you can bring it up on GIS and it, it does yeah, show. Yeah, I think that they brought that up to our project manager, so we're working on that. But we can do something in the interim before the project goes out to add. So what about some of those maintenance concerns that he brought up, though, as far as mm -hmm. load removal, grass cutting, things of like that? And we can uh, make sure that it's taken care of. The other lots in the other counties, I think they use inmates and things of that nature to take care of them. So. That's complicated, but go ahead. We'll try to make sure that our, our, when we do cut grass, those folks pick up litter. We'll make sure they get in there. Um, but yeah, they, do you want me to just do, you want me to do a maintenance update with the other ones real quick? Sure. Yeah. Here you go. Why not? Um, so we are going to be starting on the shoulders next week. Um, for some of the areas where there are low shoulders, we did get the um, work order and the, I guess, request for that from the last board meeting. Um, and we are, um, we need, we have to do some work on 604 with some ditches that Supervisor Earhart has brought to our attention and these other um, places, um, I'll make sure that they get taken care of. Um, North Carolina Road, um, I guess, I just, I know the road, but I don't know exactly where the ditch is, so I'll get with Mr. Wagner to see where that is. Um, let's see, and I'd love to have, if I could, those, uh, the video challenge for the litter pickup, because we got partners with Keep Virginia Beautiful, and we're out doing campaigns this month for getting people to adopt the highway and pick up litter. You're saying yes. And if we can <laughs> use your students' videos around the department, if you would let us Give permission. Yes, we would yes. love to use them. So we have electronic bulletin boards across the state, or maybe I can get that to our down the highway coordinator to, to pass out to, to the rest of the world. So it yeah, all goes viral after a while. <laughs> That's why I don't do social media. I'm sure some of the things I do are kind of clumsy. So anyway, that's all I had for that. So anyway. So I have a little speech that I had to write by hand because somehow I didn't make it out of the office the other day. Um, so good evening, Chairman Hodges, members of the board, citizens. Um, my name is Joyce McGowan with Virginia Department of Transportation. And tonight, in conjunction with the King William County Board of Supervisors, as required by the Code of Virginia, we will review and go over the current secondary six-year plan and the allocations that have been set forth in that um, program and proceed afterwards with a public hearing to solicit public comment on the plan's development. This year, there is a total of $708,725 over the six years. Um, is, is our person still here from the school? Okay. Um, so I was um, going to go over, um, that, that funding includes $329,100 in telefees, which can be used on any road and $379,925 that is only um, used on unpaved roads. So currently that total funding of $708,000 is um, typically been used for um, paving your unpaved roads and um, there aren't um, funds there for projects that we have done in the past like the one mile section of Dabby's Mill widening of the roads and things of that nature. Um, those um, fall under a different program, and I'll talk about that later. So with your current plan, um, I've looked at your current um, unpaved roads, and it looks like that you have um, been very successful. We have um, four on the plan, or five on the plan, Route 608 Hazelwood Road, which is set for construction in 2022. Um, based on the cost of $323,000 to do that road, it's taken a little longer to fund because unpaid road money is about $63,000 a year. So we can't build the road until we have the funds available. Um, we can't deficit fund those projects, so that's that's another two years out. Um, but this year for Hazelwood, um, I want the citizens to know that we are going to be doing a stream restoration project. Um, on the upper end of 608, near the 600 side, um, there, the stream has moved out of its normal channel and it's encroaching into our roadway. So a lot of the work that people were requesting for the road being washed out is coming from that um, change. 
And so we're, we've worked with our environmental section and some consultants, and we're going to be um, doing a project to make sure the ditches and everything stay in the water stays where it's supposed to stay. So we're not actually building the road yet, so I don't want folks to get their hopes up and think that we're going to do that and then build the road. It's a whole different project, but hopefully we'll help improve the ride surface in the interim. So um, different project, it doesn't come out of the, the um, for this project here. Um, that's the 2022 um, plan. Um, we also have Route 637 White Oak Landing that will be built in 2022. We have Route 634 Kentucky Road, and these projects, by the way, are already on the plan, so you don't have to worry about that. Route 633 Sandy Point Road, which we built in 2024. Route 624 Trimmer Shop Road, um, which is scheduled for construction in 2024. So looking at the roads in the county there are, um, and the funding that you have available, there are three roads that um, we can put on the plan and continue to get these roads paved. Um, those are um, the ones that I would recommend adding in FY24 and 25 for construction in 26 and beyond um, would be Route 617 West Spring Forest Road. Route 621 Green Level Road and Route 600 East River Road. Um, 600, um, I call it 600 Dirt Road because there's so many 600s in the county. Uh, but 600 Dirt Road, um, we are working to replace some of the pipes there at the bottom and re-ditch the area so that the washouts that keep occurring during the heavy rains when upstream water comes down to that low point don't wash the road out um, as frequently. But we're going to be doing that now um, with our maintenance side, so there will be an improvement made until we can get that on the plan. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. what, the three roads that you just recommended, mm -hmm. what, they're not they're, they're not, not they're not listed anywhere. Yet. They're not. You don't have anything to look at or reference while you're talking. I just want to make sure. Oh, okay. So Route 617 West Spring Forest is just off of Route 30, and it has and I um, look at these based on the board's past. Um, position on the roads is by the vehicle count. So um, Spring Forest has 80 vehicles a day. Green Level and East River um, have 60 vehicles a day. Um, so they're the three highest roads in the county. The, there is only one road left that has over 50 vehicles a day in the county. Spring so, Forest is off of Upshaw, right? Isn't that off of? Off of Route 30 past Hamilton Homes. Just right here. Just up okay. That way, yeah. Okay, I know where Green Level is. And what was the other one? 600, it, it intersects with Green Level. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so um, those are the only, those, there are four roads eligible in the county at this point. The roads that go on the secondary plan for unpaved roads have to have over 50 cars a day. Um, so right now we have enough money based on our estimates to put three on the plan. The fourth one is Route 627 East St. John's Church Road, which is um, down the county um, toward um, 632, going to Pamunkey, Cahoke Mill Road, and, um, that way. Um, it's the one on the southbound off of Route 30. Um, so that road is eligible with 54 cars a day, but we don't have the funding to add it this year. So I, wanted, I know that's a road that we get a lot of calls on, and it's making its way up the list. Um, so, all of these uh, roads, we get a lot of calls. Yeah. <laughs> so, but as far as being eligible, we usually have, we, we have had lists, you know, I guess since we've had these five and a couple in the past, we've had probably, we've done about 15 um, in the last five to eight years, I guess. Are all um, three of these, in the all three of these roads are in second district? They are. That's what I thought, I want to make sure. So there aren't any other roads in any of your districts that qualify. Um, so we can't add any other roads but the four that are eligible for the unpaved roads. So to, to make that um, distinction, so three, um, based on the funding that we have in FY24 and 25, which is about um, $220,000 minus what we need to finish Trimmer Shop, um, which is about 30. So we have enough money to add these three and fund them through 20, next year when we come back, we can add another road, and if the counts change on roads in the other areas or second district, um, <laughs> I'm not to work. Um, there may be others that we could add. So um, 
that um, that that right now the scenario. So you can add the three roads, 617, 621, and 600, with the anticipation that next year when you get your allocations, you're going to see money for 2026 show up on the plan. We can use that money to add um, East St. John's Church and. Um, that one would go on the plan. After that, unless there's a road that has 50 cars a day, we won't be able to fund the, any more roads for the unpaid road program with the unpaid road money. So with that, um, I think I'm going to leave that. Route 600, um, the paved project there um, at 360 is still in the plan. It is fully funded. Um, we've worked out all of the utility issues and finished our design, so we're going to build that this year with state forces. Um, so that will come off the plan next year, and then we can look at any other projects that you may want to, to do. But um, keep in mind that the secondary six-year plan is for construction, or spot improvements, unpaid road construction, um, roads with numbers higher than route than with numbers of 600 or higher, so a secondary road is about 600, 612, 1002, things like that. Um, it is not for the maintenance of the roads for things like potholes, um, snow removal, paving, um, grass cutting, tree removal, shoulder repairs, etc. Um, and I just wanted to remind the board while we were here in this work session that the secondary six-year plan um, like I mentioned earlier, um, doesn't have the funding that you may need for projects that you'd like to see. Um, and what we're doing is um, trying to make sure that the counties are aware that through smart scale funding, transportation alternatives, and revenue sharing and, and, and programs like that, we're working with staff to, um, if there are any projects that come up, to try to figure out where they fit and where the county can apply for those funds. Um, smart scale is the way that the counties can now get projects for bigger reconstructions like we did for Route 360 and 30, um, the, the, the park and ride. Um, other counties have used it for sidewalk projects, for um, road widenings, um, just any, any project that can help um, fix a safety issue, ease congestion, um, spur economic development. It's all weighted and rated and they're scored. Um, so that is how projects get into programs now. So um, this summer we're going to have a locality day. We're going to invite county staff to come and learn about the programs and then try to start putting together the data that we have on projects that we think would be beneficial along with the county's input to see where we can come up with projects that will fit into those programs. Um, that you'd like to, to apply for. So I just wanted to um, you know, put that out there because our six-year program is, is smaller compared to some of the other pots of money that are available, and I don't want the localities to miss out on those. So with that, um, I want to thank you in, in, for your time, and I can answer any questions you have. The Smart Scale Project on 360 and 30, I believe we're starting construction on that next year. Is that the case? Yes, and that project, um, when it was developed um, and applied for, um, it does have room for other improvements that may be able to be added to that. There's some things in West Point, you know, some of the, you know, more um, the growth areas that you have, um, and maybe some of your secondary where it may serve economic development or things like that. Those are places where we need to, to look to see if, if there's a project that needs to, to be put into the, the scoring. Make a motion we adopt resolution 19.0. I gotta get out of your way. All right, Howard, I appreciate it. I, I have a lot of stuff to say. cover, I'm sorry. I don't understand. All right, folks, I open a public hearing on resolution 19-21, approving King William County Secondary Road System six-year plan 20 23 25 and the secondary system construction budget for fiscal year 2019-20. Anyone that would like to come forward as an individual, you have three minutes as a group, you have five. Me and uh, Gene Campbell reside in the second district, 446 White Oak Land in Maine. And I just want to thank you, the board, for considering and including 
white old man be laying in your six-year plan. And I want to thank BDOT, because they always respond real quickly when the road needs grading or maintained. And this group, good group of guys down there at the local highway department. And I want to thank them. You tell them, George. I tell them every time I see them, too. Thank you very much. Thanks. to thank you for all your efforts working with us on the 2020 budget during the work session on April 12th. Based on the discussions and guidance from the board, we have prepared proposed resolutions in the ordinance to adopt county tax rates for calendar year 2019. We appreciate the board's consideration of each resolution we propose tonight. Resolution 1922 proposes for the board's consideration the adoption approval of fiscal year 2020 operating budget. Revenue adjustments for 2020 included a reduction to established tax rate from 88 cents per 100 to 86 cents per 100 in assessed valuation. The breakdown of that rate is 38 cents county and 48 cents schools. The expenditure adjustment included Funding Bay Transit at the agency's requested rate, unless King and, King and Queen County and Town of West Point does not match same level in 2020. On April 22nd, 2019, King and Queen County approved their request. The Town of West Point will be meeting tomorrow evening. For discussion at the April 12th work session, we will follow your direction and reduce funding if King and Queen County and the Town of West Point do not fund the requested rate. The adoption of this resolution will confirm the budget as drafted. I will also present a resolution this evening to appropriate the funds for the presented budget. The staff recommends approval of resolution 1922. Mr. Chairman, I motion that we adopt resolution 1922. Second. Comments? Discussion. The 
um, school budget expenses that were given tonight? Is there any change or correlation with 1922? I mean, no. Uh, we had we requested that they update the information that had been provided at the uh, April 12th work session. The information did not correlate with the county administration's recommendation in the bright system. So we did ask the school to get in line with what we had presented. To right. So April 8th, we had a work session. We had a posted in our budget book saying that the school budget would be revised. So the budget that we're acting on tonight for 2020, this is not on this is based on the county uh, administration's recommendations. Right. So this is not the same budget that's on the school website. The school website is not going to give as much detail as that. That is, is giving you the breakdown by... So the, so the detail by programs and stuff like this is not on the school website? Not like that. No, sir. I'm sorry. That's, that's, yeah. that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, that gives it a, a really good breakdown. Are you going into your presentation? I only have one slide for just for discussion for all of you. So, why the board should not approve the FY20 budget? We heard from Mr. Greenwood who advocated a new project in his district to help augment citizens' taxes. However, when he was asked in 2015 to support BPOL, and we had a option to go forward with eliminating B poll to stimulate economic growth? The answer was no. I still think we need to eliminate B poll to stimulate growth in this county, especially in light of the July presentation when the uh, Virginia Economic Department partner partnership came out, development partnership came out, so one of their recommendations is to eliminate B poll. Um, we can't, we can't have it both ways. <clears throat> also, aside from the FY17 budget, and, and Mr. Muskalski was, I guess, smart enough not to respond to the candidate information, aside from the FY17 budget, every person on this board said operating budget is too high. We cut it in FY17, it's continued to go up, up for every year since then, operationally. Um, not, maybe not the budget as a whole, because obviously we were in debt service last year. But I'm not supporting it, because I said it was too high. It continues to be too high. Is that it? That's it. Uh, question by me, Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. Let the others go. Thank you, Stas. Gentleman has the floor. I'll wait my turn. Tanya, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. I'm still, as with our last planning commission, I'm still confused in some of these items, and I'm asking because it's the resolution 2023. I understand is a standalone resolution, but it refers to the adoption of the numbers, the cost in the 2020 budget, uh, whereas line 13. So before we get there, since we're talking about the budget and discussing these, and Mr. Eric has brought some interesting topics, I only have. Again, I know we've talked about this in the past, but I'm a little confused. And perhaps you can help me, Ms. Fastenberg, before you can chair. Clarification, please. Only four questions I have to ask. And these are all with regards to the, the health insurance premiums. And again, before we get to 1923, because these health insurance premiums are built into the budget, the increases. Now, is it? It's my understanding. Let me, let me ask the question before you go. Are you go ahead. 1923 or are you going 1922? No, I believe the one that I'm referring to is where we're talking about the uh, subscribers and the key advantage and the, uh, how we're going to increase the county employee health care coverage, which is part.
part of the 2020 budget. I think what he's saying, Mr. Chairman, is 23 is a component of the overall budget of 22. So that's yes, that's why he's drilling yeah, down. So I don't want to be trying to vote on two different. All right, sir. I just don't want to be trying to discuss and, and vote on. No, I understand. Two this two is a special Go ahead. Yes. yes. Thank you. Mr. Pastor, if I may, it's my understanding that the $529,000 health insurance premium increases this year for schools and county combined. That's the number that we have been given in our 2020 budget, the five, $529,000. What is school schools have asked for is separate from what the county is asking for. What the schools are asking for for any increases in their um, health coverage would be included in that $10 million for operational funds that the board would be providing. The county is, I don't know the increase amount. It's a hundred and some thousand dollars. Okay. The so total is 529, I think. I think the school was like four, 30. Yeah. Four, yeah, 430, and the county was like 110, something like that. For, So does that is that fairly close or fairly accurate? I mean, I understand the distinctions that you made, and that's a great help. And Supervisor Earhart, thank you for that clarification. My understanding and recollection is that last year uh, it was about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the uh, for the health insurance that we pick up. The the county picked up was that correct? Is that a correct number? Because we forego the employees, the town employees, a pay raise, but we picked up some more of their health insurance premiums. Not to the tune of 350000 It was uh, much less than 100000 Um If you're talking about three fifty, then you're including the schools again. Yes. And we have no control over the health coverage that is um, managed or cared for at the schools, and we include that in their operational. So we don't have the details on that. If you're talking about the county, I think last year's increases was maybe around seventy. Thank you. That's very helpful to me. My three, third, or four is. Uh, are the plans for the counties slash? I guess I keep asking this about schools, and perhaps I'm confusing myself. Are the plans for the counties and school employees to absorb any of this increase uh, with regards to, uh, to this year, the 2020 budget? Are this are the? Perhaps we should not talk about the schools. As I understand, you said twice that the schools are a separate issue. With regards to the county, are the employees themselves going to absorb any of the additional costs? This, um, moving forward into FY20, there was no increase yes. for the rates. What you saw as an increase was individuals electing family plans or plus one plans, whereas in the past they may have just yes. elected single. Um, but no, the rates are not going to be changing, and I did not recommend that between the employer and the employee percentage that that change as well. Thank you. And my last question. As I recall last year, the and I just mentioned this in my previous question, that the, we recommended last year no sal salary increase because the county was picking up the entire increase for the employees last year. I think you just said, yes, that was true. I'm, I'm, is that true or not? What we did was we reevaluated the percentage that the employee and the employer um, shared. And so in FY19, we adjusted it so there would not be any burden on the employee because we did not give any type of increase. But we did not not give the increase because of that. Uh, the reason that we did not give an increase in FY19 was because we were redirecting our funding to infrastructure and debt service payments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Hessner. That's all I have. Yes, um, since this is the first time we've seen this slide, I'm kind of at a loss, but like I said, it seems like mine ain't going to big on there. At least you could spell it for me. So. Oh, well, that's true. But, uh, um, maybe back when I started eight years ago, that was my opinion for people, but since then I've learned, and all the people that I've talked to in my district, the business owners, I'm not unhappy with the people like we talked about in our before work session. Most of the businesses are under the gross amount that only pays $50 anyway, and they're not complaining about that $50. 
So I've learned over time that that's not where the issues are. So I've changed my mind according to what my citizens want. And if we did get rid of it, we talked about this in the board session, the taxes would go up to the, the so homeowners. It doesn't help the homeowners at all. The homeowners, or y'all keep complaining about having to pay too much money. If you take the tax away from the businesses, the homeowners are going to have to pay that tax. I, you're contradicting yourself all the damn time. I'm sick of it. But anyway, I'm going for the best budget that we come up with in this test scenario, and the board came up with a two-step decrease this year, which I was very happy with. I didn't think we were going to get that. We still cover all the things that we need to cover. Thank you. Understand. Mm, my turn. Thank you. Um, so, people, we've talked about this at length, and I, I, I want it to be very clear that um, that is an irreplaceable revenue source for the schools. If you want to eliminate people, you are going to cut the schools by whatever people brings in. $420,000 thereabouts on an annual basis. There is no way to replace that revenue uh, unless you want to uh, increase the real estate rate, but even that isn't necessarily an option on the table because then you start to run afoul of the constraints placed upon us by the split levy, uh, which drives a lot of how we have to uh, allocate revenue between the county and the schools to make sure that we are not allocating general fund money to the schools. So uh, when we talk about eliminating people, and when we talk about uh, eliminating vehicle license tag tax, we're talking about cutting the schools uh, is what it comes down to. So that's, that's your choice. You don't really have another choice in that. Um, the only other replacement revenue source that was brought up was to place uh, over three quarters of a million dollars in new taxes on farmers. Uh, I personally, in my years on the board, have not seen farmers cost us a great deal of money. So uh, I will not support uh, placing new taxes on one class of people uh, that I think unfairly burdens um, them and their operation, especially when we're talking about an industry that is vital to a rural locality uh, like King William. And then lastly, this idea, again, that, that the operating budget is, is too high is, is based on a narrative that just gets, uh, you know, you put it in the paper enough and I guess people start to believe it. But, uh, you know, quite frankly, um, it's, it, it's a false narrative. Um, you know, the budgets around here for years have been razor thin. Uh, capital needs have gone unfunded. Needed positions have gone unfilled. Uh, compression issues have run wild as we haven't been able to consistently give salary increases. You know, we're, we're finally starting to turn a corner on these things and are actually making and adopting budgets that are meeting the needs of, uh, of, of this governmental operation and its people, that are meeting the needs of its employees that have for years put up with a rather underfunded operation that have continued to improve uh, the schools, which are a vital asset in this community, uh, and which are now starting to uh, try to spur some activity in economic growth. So uh, I am happy to support this budget and its real estate tax rate reduction the fourth and four years, which is a product of very smart work by our staff, uh, sacrifices, uh, forward thinking, uh, and, and I think uh, that it's, it's a great job by our staff, uh, and, and, uh, and I look forward to adopting it, quite frankly. You take it down the road every time you do. Uh, it, every year I ask you to bring up something to replace that with, but all you want to do is cut the school. And again, I, I'll repeat, folks that don't have kids makes it easy. To, to cut that and cut the school without any replacement. And I'm not going to vote for that. Um, yeah, I thought the tax rate, and I know it's exactly what question 12 is from a Tea Party's question there, uh, was too high, and it was, and we haven't reduced that since then over the last period of years. And I hope we can well continue that tonight. It wasn't the tax rate, 
I said I, I read that, Mr. Earhart, and I have the floor at this point. Uh, I will put on this button, and like Mr. Laskowski said, the staff, all the staff, have worked diligently on this. I have flashbacks from previous administrators, and I'm not going back to that. I will agree with this budget. A follow-up to uh, the Honorable Muskowski on this. I was in the room years ago when the previous board raised the taxes 12 cents. And I remember the arguments were being made at that time that how the, we had to raise 12 cents to fill the different funding issues and the uh, operations of the county. Obviously that uh, board is gone and this new board is here and New board has determined over these past four years that those that 12 cents was perhaps a little bit um, aggressive. But when uh, the Honorable Muskowski says that, well, before me, step back one second. What, you know, it's difficult for myself and perhaps some of my constituents, as I've had discussing this with them, to see how our services have increased with that 12 cent increase in taxes from the past board or how they've been impacted by the reduction of 8 cents in taxes with this board, it seems to me we're somewhat at a status quo as far as services to our constituents to the county. But we're doing pretty well for the county employees and pretty well for some of the county employees. The issues that, only a couple more issues. When the Honorable Muskowski says, well, this is going to, there's nowhere to make up these revenues. And then, sir, I believe you just said that after that shortly, that, well, we could make up if we looked at the getting rid of the, um, the exemption for agriculture. But that's not on the table. I understand that. So that's one area that we could have gone, but that's not going to go there because it's not on the table. Another area that we've talked about in the past, and the previous board also did, about eliminating the forestry exemption, which could make up some of that difference for the schools. But again, those are issues that are not on the table. So I think it's a little bit, in my opinion, disingenuous to say there are not places that we can go, sir, to look at making up those uh, lost funds when we have those two uh, exemptions that we allow certain groups in the county to have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. If you won't rule me out of order, I'll just go ahead and make a motion. We adopt ordinance 04 19 setting the tax rates for FY20, or I'm sorry, for calendar year uh, 19. Yeah. I'll second that too. If you don't get that out of order either. <laughs> Chairman, I'll just keep on rolling and uh, move to adopt resolution 1920, adopting the FY20 uh, employee health plan. Resolution 19 23. I'll second that also. Any discussion? Um, no, you addressed all those issues previous. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Castaneri. My questions, anyway.
next item is item E, consideration of resolution 1924, approving fiscal year 2019 position allocation list pursuant to section 2-5 of the Kingman County Personnel Policies and Procedures Plan. Ms. Lane. Resolution 1924 proposes for the board's consideration the adoption of position allocation list per section 2-5 of the King William County Personnel Policies and Procedures Manual. We are required to present to the board annually at budget time a summary of the changes for your consideration and approval. Changes to be noted within the fiscal year 2020 class and compensation plan were made mid-year in the current fiscal year, retitling existing positions from full program needs. This include, included a senior deputy sheriff category and a retitling dispatch supervisor to lead dispatch. The staff recommends approval of resolution 1924. Discussion. Or is number 1924? Resolution 1924. Thank you. Go ahead, one more. So moved. Second. Discussion. Olivia. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hanson? No. Mr. Earhart? Aye. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Next item is item F, consideration of resolution 1935 adopting the Kingman County Capital Improvement Program for <coughs> fiscal years 2020 through 2024. Resolution 1925 proposes for the board's consideration the adoption of capital improvement plan for fiscal years 2020 through 2024. Each year, a capital improvement program is developed and presented for planning purposes as part of the annual budget process. The budget adoption and appropriation process only commits and establishes authority of expenditures for the projects in the 2020 capital improvement plan. The remainder of that plan is for short to mid-range planning purposes and serves as a guide by documenting future capital needs. The capital improvement plan resolution for consideration is for the needed projects within the fiscal year 2020 <coughs> budget. The staff recommends approval of resolution 1925. Yeah, we move. So moved. Second. Discussion. Of course, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think the the um, presentation was very well put together. However, I did miss on its uh, one, two, three, the third line down. And this I'm just referring to the FY 2020 Department five year request for CIP. Uh, this one is County Administration Broadband Initiative. This one does not, it, what it says is uh, the general fund planning from the FY 218 allocation. But I'm a little bit confused because I don't see any numbers in there. I apologize. What was what's the allocation that should be in that slide? It's two hundred twenty-five thousand. But there's no allocation that should appear in that slide because we are not allocating any more money to that fund. We are simply retaining the money that is in the fund. So there's no new money coming out of this general fund, anything like that. We appropriated that money two years ago. We've not spent it. We retain it in that fund. We are not appropriating any new money. Didn't appropriate any new money last year. Are not doing so this year. So no, no money should show up in this slot. Thank you for explaining that. I really that's much help. Great help. Mr. Chairman, clarification the there was a first and second, right? Yes, sir. Say that again. There was a first and a second? Yes. And more, this is resolution nineteen twenty five. That's correct. correct. For clarification. That's slide. correct. We just read the capital improvements plan, so I'm just referring back tying it with the resolution.
Um, this was the last month that Matt and I was, uh, month of March was the last month that Matt and I was in responding to the county under an automatic aid um, type of response. Um, there's been some talk about how getting rid of them would increase response times. Um, they only ran one call in the county in the month of March and they missed 24. And the call time in their district was reduced. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but anywhere from two to four minutes um, over the last couple of months. So it did not increase, um, it actually reduced in time with us covered. Um, EMS bill of revenues from March for a little over fourteen and a half thousand dollars. <coughs> um, you can see out of um, for the King and Fire EMS units, we continue to answer. In the mid eighties a month, in EMS calls, eighty seven calls with fourteen total fire calls. Uh, station two, uh, they ran eight total EMS calls um, and three total fire calls. Um, when you break it down to percentages. Um, the county units are running 58% of total call volume, where Station 2 is running 5%. Uh, station 3, um, they're paid over 24%. Station 3, the volunteers are 12%. Um, there were 150 total calls for the month of EMS. Um, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, if, if I might. Okay. Um, on the uh, staffing chart, could we, since we've uh, and talk with um, the, specifically the magnetic about focusing on weekend staffing. Could we put days of the week on here so I don't have to go through my calendar and figure out which days of the week we're talking about? Yeah. We just make that report a little bit more. Oh, so, so on the, like I said, first I'll put Friday the first. Exactly. Second, yeah. Second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a little bit, this is something redundant. A question with regard to this report on your EMS staff units. I thought uh, the funding for Station 6, Manipo and I had been uh, uh, taken away. Is, does that start next month, or was that at the beginning of this month? Because it shows activity at Station 6 in your report. And, uh, they did run into counting through the end of March, and this uh, report goes through the end of March. For my clarification, they do respond in the county. They did not. They do not anymore. As of April 1st, they did not They do not respond into the county anymore. At the end of March was their last day. I, don't, I can't remember whether March has 30 or 31 days. At the so end of March, they no longer, as of April 1st, they no longer respond into the county. Okay, so you guys, in future reports, we won't see anything from Station 6? No, sir. Thank you, sir. Just to go, still going back on the behalf of, of Maggie Hick, explain to me the change in marking up and also in terms of the um, image trend. As, as I understand it, they used to be able to depart from their home. They still can. And, but they can't mark out from there. They can't use image trend from there. Uh, they, I, think, they, I think somebody's they confused. Respond. So I think somebody's confusing the different um, platforms that we currently use. Um, when we made the changes to dispatch, um, we looked at the percentage of time the second due companies or third due companies were not staffed. Um, what you can see is a lot. Um, number two is missing 78% of the calls, um, and we won't even worry about that or not. But <clears throat> Number two, Mega Hick was missing, you know, they were averaging 70, anywhere from 65 to 75% a month that calls missed. Um, I'm always, we are always trying to reduce response times, and one of the ways we um, did that was we're not setting off the tones if you're not on shift anymore. Uh, we've been on shift in units now for two years, so it should be something that should be ingrained in their heads. Um, Mega Hick continues to not want to play by the rules. They continue to not want to do what we've asked them to do. Um, and all we've asked them to do is just one shift their units. They can run from home if they would like, but when they do run from home, it adds an additional 11 minutes to their response time. Um, if they're okay with that, then that's something we live with. Um, yes, I would like for them to stab in quarters. Um, but if getting an ambulance marked up means that they're going to respond from home, then we live with that out there. 
um, our volunteers for the county, the only way they get credit is to staff and quarters. Um, you can see we reduced our response times to about seven and a half minutes in our first due. Um, that's well below the national goal of nine minutes of ALS on the scene within um, ALS on the scene within nine minutes. Um, and we'd like to keep it that way. Um, and you can see when we respond in the Main Hicks district, we're only a minute and a half slower than they are when they respond into their own district. So uh, we didn't change anything except for we're just not setting the tones off if they're not marked up. So instead of setting off three or four sets of tones, we're just setting the on-duty tones off, and that's it. Um, so I'll give you an example today. Um, Medic 4 was out on the call. Um, we had another, we had no, all, both of our other ambulances are broken at the moment. Um, so the transport unit <clears throat> was at the hospital, and we got an accident on West River Road. Um, the engine went, it staffed ALS, equipped ALS, so it can do everything but transport the medic. Um, it can do everything that a medic can do except for transport the patient. They arrived on the scene. Um, they dispatched Station 2 for their transport unit. Um, and they did not set off Station 4 stones because they weren't there to mark it up. So it saves time when, that's, when they're not setting all those different sets of tones off. And all we've asked them to do is just on shift. If they on shift and run from home, then they get tuned out for their call, just like normal. Okay. Um, so, and now to go back to ImageTrend. Um, ImageTrend is our reporting software where we capture our data on our responses. Um, Mangate does not use the county's uh, reporting software, and they're currently the only station in the county that runs into this county that doesn't use it. Walkerton uses it, West Point uses it, we use it as the county. Um, and maybe it does not use it. So what, again, this, this seems to be this circular pattern here. Uh, what needs to be done to, to reconcile this? I mean, is, is do we have some type of written SOP that says you're only going to get credit if you use image trend? Is there uh, something tied to funding that says you're not going to get credit if you don't use image trend? Uh, no, sir. We, we do not regulate. Right? We don't know. They are. So, the responses may not necessarily be accurate. They're based on image trend and not. No, I get my data. I get my data from image trend. Every time we go into somebody else's district, there's a there's a button in their reporting system where they they hit the button, and then I can run a report at the end of the month. That so they're not using we image trend. Though. We are. Right, but then it's not. Correct, and I get their data from dispatch. So if I get all of May, uh, all of Mania X data from dispatch, I. They send me a list every month of how many calls they ran, how many calls they missed, all of that stuff. And then I cross-reference it with the stuff that I have. It takes me about two days to get all the report done. But I get all my data on them, on Megahig from dispatch, where the rest of them I pull it out of my image trend software. And is the reason, do we have a reason why Megahig does not want to move in that direction? Is it simply a cost? They, it's no cost. The county takes care of it. They say it's a HIPAA violation. Um, and all the research that I've done, um, everybody from the Office of EMS to the county attorney said it's not a HIPAA violation. Okay, and this kind of segues into the last part of my discussion, again, in terms of when Chief's meeting is going to occur. Uh, we've been, we were waiting for the stuff to go through with um, Station 1 because, simply because um, I would have Chief's meetings and I would tell them, hey, this is our plan to move forward. Um, this is what we would like to do. Um, and things change so fast out here sometimes that things don't come to fruition. Um, and then they would run to y'all and tell y'all I lied to them, which I didn't. We just don't, you know, plans went awry. So we, um, I met with Ms. Tessonary and we um, decided to wait until after the, number, the Station 1 stuff went through so we could give them an accurate description of what happened um, and what was going on. Um, and until we could get the number four stuff going. Um, all that stuff seems to be going through, moving on along like it's supposed to, so we hope to have one in the month of May. That's our plan. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, the Chiefs don't have to wait till Chiefs meet to express an issue. If they've got an issue, they can call me, email me, text me anytime they want to. My phone goes off 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so they're more than welcome at any time to call me if they have an issue about anything. They don't have to wait for the Chiefs meet. And most of them do. Mr. Freeman. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to do some clarification. 
much I've been to several chiefs meetings, and that's one of the things on the previous board that Travis and I were on, wanted to push some of these implementations to direct these companies that they had to use this. They were so mad, they were so adamant about not using it. They said they work regular jobs, they're not on call all the time, they would not use the system and get on, on our system. And they said that they, we said, well, what if we implemented them? You wanted to know if we could force them to. Yes, we could have, and we were going to, but they would say they weren't going to do any calls. So we decided we'll still give them the same amount of money for doing nothing. So we still have them as a volunteer group, not following the rules that all the rest of the counties do. And I said, making up stuff that's not true, passing rumors, but we could. We could pass a rule that says they have to use it and cut their funding if they don't. But they told us if we did that, they wouldn't do anything at all. So I just want to make that clear to everybody. They keep saying all the wrong stuff, and we can make it, but then what are we going to do? Then are we going to have another county-run station there? But we don't want to do that. We want to try and work with the volunteers to keep as many of them as we have. They keep saying that we're doing it to get rid of them. We have never been doing anything to get rid of any of our volunteers. We highly regard all our volunteers, and we want to keep as many of them as possible. But when people don't follow the rules and do all this stuff behind the scenes and make Andy look bad, it's, I don't know, it just doesn't work. So we don't want to force them to do it because then we would lose more volunteers. I just wanted to make that clear. We can do it, but we decided not to because, and they specifically told us in a staff meeting that I was here, this testing was here, and Chief Agger was there, and they blamed it on, oh, it costs too much to add it to her app on the phone. How much can it cost on an app? I mean, we didn't look into that. They didn't tell me how much they had to pay, but they were not going to do it. So we're talking, you're talking about the Iron Responding app, which is how we get our calls. Right. Um, using the, the, county, the county pays for that as well. Um, we've, we've almost eliminated tone pagers altogether. They're very expensive. They're about $650 a piece right now. Um, and we, because of the app, we've almost eliminated within the county's circle um, with air stuff at station one and four, we've almost eliminated tone pickers, except for in the stations as the alerting system. Um, air folks rely heavily on the eye responding. Uh, we're getting ready to um, start using a different feature on it where um, we can start tracking our ambulances um, and our fire engines based off of the app. Um, it's automatic vehicle locator, it's built into the app. We're going to start using that. Um, we track all of our volunteer hours um, off of that app, and I can run a reported. You know, anytime I'm sitting in front of the computer and tell you how many hours each person in our um, that volunteers force has, uh, um, how many classes they've taken, we go in and we plug in classes. Uh, we're doing a class right now. Um, the um, tractor supply company has given us the house that sits on their land to use for training, um, and we're putting we put three days of classroom on of the exact same. We invited everybody in the county. Uh, we put three days of play. We're putting Saturday, um, Sunday for the volunteers, Monday, Tuesday for our career folks, um, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday will be hands on. Uh, but we wanted everybody to come to the classroom portion first. Um, and we've invited everybody throughout the county to this, and only folks from stations one and four have showed up to it. So we're doing everything we can to include folks from other stations just so they get to know each other, but they won't come down and join us for the training. And this is this is training that we don't ever really get, um, that we can actually simulate a real house and do some training of um, pulling those lines and throwing ladders and bending roofs and things like that that we don't get the opportunity to do very often. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, Mr. Uh, Supervisor Greenwood, for clarification, your comment with regards, and you've had the, historic, the history of working with the, uh, the group, would you suggest, was that your comment with regards to the station, Manganek, the, was that an observation and comment of past behavior or activities, or your suggestion that the board, your comment that the board could take away their fund, funding, was that a uh, consideration that the board should take, or was that just a comment looking at the, the big picture? That was in direct response to yours or Mr. Earhart's question about was there a way for us to make them use the system. That was a direct answer to that question only. It wasn't any of my opinion. That's what we can do. We have thought about doing that, but we didn't because it would cut their funding. And you keep saying that we cut their funding. 
We have never cut mango. It's, it's mango head, not mananganago, whatever you said. We've never cut their funding, but we might have to if we force them to use a system and they still decide not to use it. So we decided not to implement it because we didn't want to cut their funding at all. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Look forward to that meeting. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Earl, if they have any issues, please tell them to get with me and I'll try to address them as best as possible as well. We're up to board of supervisors' comments and I'm sure on the principal's staff. I'll just touch on a couple of a couple of highlights on some things we're working on uh, regionally right now. Um, I think I mentioned at, uh, at one of our recent meetings that we have uh, a site selector uh, visit. Uh, these are very highly sought after professionals in the economic development world that help companies find uh, new locations to either relocate or expand or start a business. Um, they're very hard to get uh, FaceTime with. BEDP is flying. Um, I think two of them, if they went from one to two, um, out to our region to visit sites throughout the Middle Peninsula footprint um, this Thursday. Uh, I'll be participating in some of that. This is a good, good opportunity to get really good feedback from some leading professionals on some things that we can do um, to uh, better position ourselves for, uh, for economic development. Um, so that's a pretty, uh, pretty big, uh, I think, get for us being, uh, you know, kind of an upstart little economic development organization getting BEDP to, because um, we're the first. They're only doing four this year, and we're one of the four regions, and we're also going to be the first. So uh, we're, we're proud that we were considered for that, and we're looking forward to a good day, um, a good day there. Um, and then Mr. Hansen and I uh, were at the PDC meeting uh, this past Wednesday, uh, where we talked uh, quite at length about some issues related to the upcoming um, all hazards mitigation plan and how that might affect some of our newly federally recognized tribes and some things that we're going to work on regionally to try to uh, help incorporate them into that into that plan as well because they now have to have their own uh, plan just like we do and it's and it's update time for that so um, we're doing doing a lot of work and a lot of things to accomplish uh, but uh, I'm happy to report that things are happening good things moving forward. Very good. Yes, I wanted to thank everybody. It kind of looks like our crowds are getting larger and larger all the time. I appreciate that. Uh, I am proud to say that I was on the board, uh, that we did get together. We even went with the ones that didn't vote on it, because uh, it takes us all. And like I said, we do change things with what some of their comments are. And I appreciate everything. We all work together. And I'm glad that we got a two cent decrease in the homeowner's tax rate. And I wanted to say that I appreciate Andy Agner taking over the chief uh, for the fire. We haven't had a centrally organized group for many years, as Travis and I remember from when we started. And uh, I hate that the rumors are going around the county that people are going to run against us because they want to get rid of him. They want to get rid of Ms. Tessanary. Uh, I think they're excuse me, uh, two of the best people that we've hired in the county in many years. And I also want to bring up on a personal note, uh, we didn't mention it in our last meeting, we mentioned that uh, another Mr. White passed away, but uh, I wanted to let everybody know that B.W. White passed away, the founder of B.W. White's funeral home since we last met. I wanted to make a mention of that since it wasn't brought up. Uh, he, uh, I guess, is an icon of the county, well, excuse me, for uh, doing uh, all of our funeral and virtuary um, arrangements for people. I don't know, I'm not a stupid sentimental person on this board, but anyway, sorry. Um, he helped my family on a personal note because uh, we couldn't afford that much. I love this too. Um, when I was very young, I don't remember, but my family was uh, not well to do, and we couldn't afford to bury one of our family members, and BW helped us out helped us with the arrangements and I guess worked out a deal with us and uh, we were able to do so. so. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know. I said, 
Travis is so eloquent and it, everything in his head it just comes out so perfect. And I think of things that I want to say and I know what I want to say, but it just doesn't come out. I'm sorry. I hope everybody understands. But I thank everybody. I wanted to make mention that I appreciate what Mr. B. W. White did for our county. And uh, like I said, I'm glad I voted for the budget. Ms. Tess and Eric, her staff here, all the people in the county did a wonderful job, and we still got a cut, and we still cover all the services we need to cover, and we have a full-time fire and rescue now, so I think the county is in 200% better position than it was eight years ago. Thank you very much. I understand, Mr. Ernst. Mr. Hans? Thank you. One of the things that the board often reminds, tries to remind you of at the end of each of these meetings is the importance of your being in the board or in these meetings. Some people might say, and I've heard it said before, what's the use of anyone coming to these meetings and sitting there in the audience and listening to what is said? I'm one of, and all of my uh, fellow supervisors, I believe, I'm sure that they all agree that your importance is monumental. Your being here, your consideration, your taking the time from your family, your work, your business, to be here is really important. It shows not only your consideration and your commitment to the county, but it also supports many, many, many of the ideas which are coming forth. And I'm sure the administration is the same way when they look at these things too. It's important that you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment to the county. One last thing, if I may. Travis referenced the MPPDC, the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission Committee, excuse me. One of the issues that we're discussing, and this is just a discussion, discussion at that meeting, is a Bay Transit. And there's some consideration uh, that was brought up about Uber and Lyft. It's just an area that we're beginning to look at for the entire Middle Peninsula at the MPPDC, and perhaps uh, Travis might want to pick up on this and modify it. It's not talking about getting rid of Bay Transit. It's just a consideration to look at the economy of expense possibly looking at these other transit uh, operations such as Uber and Lyft. That's all it is. It's just a discussion. No one's talking about getting rid of Bay, uh, Bay Transit. Thank you again, folks, for being here tonight. I thought we were going to have some compromises on this budget. I was sadly disappointed. Uh, I was asked, you know, you know, you want to make cuts, you want to eliminate things, you know, give me some alternatives. We went into the April 12th session with three alternatives, uh, none of which received consensus to move forward. Thus, the one main reason I voted no tonight. Uh, I did not see any compromise on the part of the other board members. There were uh, several options presented and, and how we could uh, raise additional revenues and also looking at other uh, costs that are coming down the road, whether it's um, internet, other post-employment benefits for schools, whatever it might be. Um, there were other other things presented, uh, and, and, and none of my constituents were interested in, in considering those. So I felt that there was no compromise. Uh, I had no choice but to vote against it. Behind the scenes, you know, I want to thank everybody that worked on the budget, you know, whether it was a department head or, or Ms. Tassinari. Uh, a lot of people, for one reason or the other, don't like Ms. Tassinari. I think she's a great administrator. Um, and you all might know, not know that I personally, I personally got her here. I, I, I found her on Indeed. And I asked her to apply for the job. So um, directly or, or indirectly, uh, I feel that that is one thing that was, was beneficial to the county was, was my time to, to call through potential applicants. Uh, and unfortunately for us, she lived here in the county and, and it was a win-win. She, she wanted to give back to her community as well. And I'm, I'm certainly glad that we have her here. Um, I don't have... I have no stake in this other than, you know, what is the, the impact, what is the legacy to the 7% of the people that live in this county that uh, are below um, poverty level, the 17% of senior citizens in this county. 
uh, the, the folks that don't have a voice other than you know going door to door and hearing from them. Um, I have no property and land use. You know, I'm not someone that's going to come in here and bark, bark, bark to keep land use. Uh, the, there's a thing that dealing with you know an immediate family member. Um, there's there's you know you can do the research. There's someone on this board that although it's not an immediate family member, uh, he has potential inheritance involving land use. I have nothing to gain by doing this other than to neutralize the playing field, to provide a better long-term financial objective for all the residents of this county and not a select group or class. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you all for coming. And you now have a budget for the upcoming year with my shut down anyway. Uh, and I don't know, I do know Mr. Earhart recommended Ms. Tassinari, but I thought that was a vote on that. Oh, of course. A majority vote that got her to it. But we do appreciate what y'all done in the entire state. It was an excellent budget. Uh, I didn't see any issues with it. With that being said, I thank you. We, I am going to make a motion now to go in closed session in accordance with section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia, I move that the Board of Supervisors convene in closed session to consider a personal matter involving the performance evaluation of the county administrator. Second. Olivia. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Hankin? Aye.